So, hi, I'm Lubos. I'm from Collabora. And thanks for, uh, to Guadec for having me. I haven't been to Guadec since quite some time. Uh, last time I did a talk at Guadec was just a GSOC talk. I was still a student back then. And this is my first full Guadec talk. So, hope you enjoy it. Um, and it's about a project uh, I've been working on uh, for the last couple of months um, and uh, was sponsored by Valve. Um, it's uh, about using the GNOME desktop or general Linux desktop uh, in VR. And a use case for that, uh, if you're not into VR that much, is uh, not only to have uh, the only the desktop in your VR headset, but also to combine it with existing VR applications. So if you play a game in VR that you can see a, a chat window or you can play solitaire because it's actually more fun than the VR game um, or interact in any other way how you could with the Linux desktop. So when I first got a VR headset back in the day in 2013, I plugged it into my PC and I saw the Linux desktop on it, but it was like just an extended monitor and it wasn't aware of stereoscopy or uh, anything else. Um, and the procedure was to move uh, the window of the uh, render, renderer to, to, to this extended window so you can have stereoscopy. Uh, but these days we have uh, improved VR support in the graphics stack on Linux and we have uh, VR runtimes that take care of, of the rendering and now it's time to bring back the desktop in 3D and uh, render it correctly. And not only that, but also another problem is uh, we want to use VR controllers like standard VR input to control uh, 2D windows and to, to mimic uh, the, the concepts of 2D desktop input. So this is just an overview screenshot of uh, packing a bunch of windows at the same time uh, in one view. You can also have windows behind you and under you and over you. Uh, so this is just a part of a field of view. And uh, in, during this talk, I will start by introducing you into XR concepts in general um, and then show a few open source projects uh, to, to visualize the open source stack in XR and in the end I will get to XR desktop uh, user experience and concepts we implemented and also some technical stuff about XR desktop. So let's first start with a very brief XR crash course. I try to keep that minimal so I can also talk about other stuff. Uh, the first question that you might, might have is, uh, wasn't it called VR? Why is it called XR now? Uh, and that's pretty simple because we have a ton of, uh, or a couple of inter-reality systems. Um, and VR is one of that, with being full virtual reality, not having any elements of the real world at all. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, uh, we have uh, the augmented reality where you just have virtual elements in the real world. And between that, you can have things like augmented virtuality, which is uh, not a popular term, but it's a term for having real elements in the virtual world. For example, if you want to see a keyboard uh, from the real world, you can have like a video see-through overlay in the virtual world to, to see what your hand's actually doing. Um, and uh, between that, we have the terms mixed reality and XR, which can also be uh, called extended reality, but the X can also stand like a variable for all of the other uh, letters in this. Uh, to visualize that, we have the reality virtuality continuum, which was coined in '94 by a guy named Milgram. And you see on, on, on the left side of this axis, we have the real world. That's the world you're in right now. And uh, on, on the other side, it's, it's the full virtual environment. That's uh, when you have a virtual reality headset and don't see any real elements. And between that, we have uh, virtual elements in the real environment and 
real elements uh, in the uh, virtual environment. So this spectrum can be called mixed reality. Uh, the term mixed reality wasn't picked up by Kronos when they did the open XR standard, but XR was preferred. So uh, I will use the standard term XR. Uh, MR is uh, called in a set of Microsoft products. They use the term a lot, but the term itself is way older than that. Uh, as you can see, it's from 94. Um, so what type of XR devices are there? Uh, there's way more than that, but maybe in the consumer area or in the right now available area, I, I can just put them into three categories. Um, what you can buy if you, if you go to AliExpress and uh, have a budget of 10 bucks is just uh, a Google Cardboard like device, which is just a pair of lenses and you can put your phone in. Uh, and it does rendering with your phone's display and tracking with the phone's uh, sensors. Uh, and that's, of course, the cheapest alternative because the phone rendering is weak. It, it's getting better, but it's not, nothing compared to a, a PC with a dedicated graphics card. Um, so for the enthusiast or for real VR nowadays, we have like the PC tethered headset. Um, that's something you can plug into your PC but it's uh, a hassle to set it up. So you usually need to set up a tracking system with cameras uh, and uh, it's not that uh, easy to, to take with you and you can't go outside with it. Um, and as a modern uh, alternative, we have uh, as a third option, uh, the standalone headset um, with, with a belt PC, for example. So uh, you can put some power uh, into that, so compute, computational power, uh, by having just an embedded PC on your belt. And uh, it can be manufactured that uh, it deals with heat better than your phone, and uh, a belt PC is a valid option for a standalone uh, VR headset. Um, in this case, the third one is an optical see-through headset, so you don't have a display in it uh, that occludes the real world but rather uh, shows the real world. Um, optical see-through has some disadvantages as well. You cannot have full occlusion on the display, so you will always see a bit of the real world and the quality is better indoors than in, in direct sunlight, for example. Um, so my work currently focuses on the PC tethered headset because it's the most hackable one. You have a PC with running with Linux and uh, you can do whatever you want. Um, on, on, on the other devices, it's maybe hard to unlock the bootloader or, or get hacking with it, but uh, I hope the time will come that there will be more accessible uh, standalone devices to hack with. Uh, in terms of tracking, uh, we have a thing called IMU, it's the Inertial Measurement Unit. It's a uh, bunch of sensors on, on this small PCB uh, with uh, gyroscope and uh, accelerometer mostly, where you can uh, read out the data and filter it to a real world uh, rotation. And uh, that's the problem with uh, IMU only tracking. You have only the rotation. So it's three degrees of freedom. Uh, it's called three degrees of freedom. You can rotate the hat, but if you go, uh, if you move uh, up and down or move in the room, uh, then the IMU only tracking is not enough. You will need external tracking, uh, like here, for example. These are the Vive base stations. They emit lasers onto the headset and the headset has sensors. Uh, so it knows where it is in the room. Uh, on the other hand, we have a different type of external optical tracking uh, where the headset emits uh, LEDs and you will need to track it with a camera. Both systems have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, this is what the Vive has, this is what the Oculus has. Um, and external optical tracking is way harder to implement since filtering uh, the, the position becomes more complicated than just from the one IMU sensor, since uh, you need to also consider 
the sensor data from the, from the IMU still, since it's at a way higher frequency than the data we get from the cameras or from the optical sensors. Uh, and another type of tracking, uh, which is maybe the most convenient to use but the hardest to implement, is just based on computer vision. Uh, it's simultaneous localization and mapping, uh, an algorithm from robotics, uh, which just uses, can use just a one monochrome camera feed and determine the position. It will get better if you have a depth uh, camera feed or stereo camera feed, but it's enough uh, to run uh, on a mono black and white camera. So this is also used in many headsets nowadays, mostly in standalone headsets because uh, the standalone headsets don't want to have any external gear to need it to be set up, but it's also the hardest one to implement. In terms of input devices, I would also uh, show you three categories. Um, the, the first one is more, um, like the, the most simple one. Uh, that's a remote controller, uh, controller from uh, the Google Daydream. Uh, it's also when you, you when you buy a headset on AliExpress, my, most likely you will get a controller like this. It only has an IMU, so it doesn't pick up where it is in the room, but it just picks up the rotation. So it's actually pretty similar to, to this presentation controller, uh, but my presentation controller doesn't have an IMU. Um, and as a second option, uh, there's the fully tracked PC uh, VR controller, which needs an external tracking system. Uh, it's, uh, I, I guess, has the, the best ability to be displayed in VR, and it has a bunch of um, options from also from PC gaming controllers, but uh, also things like finger tracking, like um, this is the Valve Index controller, the controller that was used to be called Knuckles. Um, I actually. Uh, I have one here, uh, you can just pass it around and play with it, but, but I need it back, I need to work with it. So, um, And the third option is the most natural one. This controller is the one you have with you right now, it's your hands. Um, as well, it's the hardest one to implement uh, since you need uh, hand tracking. So hand tracking is a topic for itself. Um, uh, on the first uh, image we see a leap motion camera, it's a stereoscopic a wide angle infrared camera uh, that uh, uses, uh, ev that does everything in software. Uh, it does a skeleton model of the hands uh, that is represented uh, in VR then. So it's the most convenient one because you just need a camera. The disadvantage of that is if, if your hands leave the field of view of the camera, then the tracking is obviously gone. Uh, so to, to work around that, you need just more cameras, uh, even if they're in the room or something. Uh, a more classical approach is a haptical tracker like that. Uh, I tried, uh, so the setup is very hard. It's like you need 10 minutes to get into it and you need to trust it because it has haptic feedback so it won't break your fingers, but usually it's not that strong, so uh, it's, uh, it won't hurt you. Uh, but the advantage of that is that you have the haptic feedback, so you can simulate something you touch roughly. Uh, of course, it's, it's not like real because it's not very uh, fine, but uh, it's haptic feedback anyway. So uh, to work around the haptic feedback, the lack of haptic feedback, we need to do other things, um, which I will come to later. So this was the first part, it was like the rough crash course of XR, what, what kind of stuff is there. And uh, now I wanted to present some, um, some code projects in open source um, that try to support or deal with all the problems we face in XR. Uh, one important thing uh, that happened to the Linux graphics stack recently is the direct mode. That means that you plug in your HMD and it does, the, the, the PC knows or the graphics stack knows, this is not a monitor, I won't extend the desktop to it because you don't want to see a 2D mouse cursor uh, on, on, on the HMD. 
another thing that you don't want to have is uh, the refresh rate being synchronized with the desktop, which is mostly like 60 hertz. Um, for others, it's uh, 144, for example. But um, VR headsets tend to have a refresh rate of 90 or uh, 144 with more recent ones. Also, you want to have native resolution. And direct mode makes that possible. So uh, with the non-desktop option in, in current XORG, you are able to, to, to control this with a Vulkan extension. And uh, the Vulkan extension for X11 is called Acquire Excellent Display. And Wayland support is currently work in progress. So as we speak, there is a discussion on the a merge request in Vulkan to uh, merge the Acquire VL display extension. I'm looking forward to that since it's the only reason that keeps me on Xorg. Um, and we implemented, or I implemented this extension for uh, X11 in our compositor in Monado. So if you use Monado, you get support for this. Um, other notable projects are maybe OpenHMD, which is uh, which is doing a lot of work. Uh, it's a community of enthusiasts that reverse engineer many headsets since the protocols are not really documented at all and they have their ways to, to get the data out of the headset and to, to catalog the USB identifiers and stuff like that. Uh, but OpenHMD is very minimal. It doesn't have a compositor. It's just really talking to the device drivers and has a very limited tracking. In contrast to that, we have LibSurvive, uh, which is a dedicated uh, driver for the Vive. Uh, it started with Lighthouse Redux mentioned below there, which is a USB protocol documentation for the Vive. Um, then we picked it up at Collabora. We did a prototype driver called Vive Libre, and LibSurvive forked that at some point, and they are continuing to develop it. Uh, the, the most interesting problem about the Vive is to implement the external tracking with proper filtering and so it's a reliable and performant. And there are also a ton of other projects that uh, do tracking related stuff. Um, for example, MapLab is a SLAM implementation. It's, I guess, BSD license, uh, which works with several kinds of sensors. Uh, so there's many SLAM implementations from robotics um, that we can also use in XR. Uh, another development which was very interesting in, in XR is the specification of the Chrono standard. Uh, so before that, as you can see, there were like five proprietary APIs, more or less proprietary, and uh, it was solved at the level of the game engine to implement all of them uh, with OpenXR. Uh, the landscape hopefully will look like that in the future. So OpenXR is like the OpenGL of VR to have a standard API across hopefully all platforms. So your application won't just run on one vendor's API. And uh, we wanted to support the standard, so we implemented it uh, in a runtime. So this the piece of software that implements uh, OpenXR is called uh, XR Runtime. It's, it's comparable to Mesa, uh, but for OpenXR, for, uh, for XR applications. We use uh, the drivers from OpenHMD, but we also write currently new internal drivers, uh, for example, for the PSVR, which will be our first device with six degrees of freedom tracking. We use the PSVR cameras for that. Uh, so my colleagues are working on that. And yeah, we have a compositor that works with direct mode. So now you know everything about open source VR or XR. Uh, and we can now get back to XR desktop. Um, and XR desktop uh, uh, currently uh, uses uh, many of this functionality you saw. Uh, it's on, uh, it runs on PC tethered headsets. Um, currently, we, we run on the Vive and the Vive Pro and the Valve Index since we, uh, we have the OpenVR API from uh, Steam implemented, but we are working 
on the OpenXR API. So it will run across all the devices that imp are implemented in OpenHMD or in Monado. So let's do some UX. Um, you have to imagine uh, that you have a window in front of you uh, and want to grab it with a pointer. Uh, so we have this Knuckles controller that you maybe touched already, and it has a trigger button. Uh, the trigger button is the button you touch with your index finger. Uh, and uh, if you want to uh, drag the window, so you have a cursor, the 3D cursor uh, it is a ray uh, in XR desktop. And uh, we test for intersection, so uh, if, you, if you hit an object, the pointer tip, uh, that's the, the front of the cursor, uh, uh, gets, turns blue, and you know that you can grab the object. Um, the object will maintain the transformation uh, or, uh, that, that you, your hand does, so you can also do like, more complex rotations with your hand uh, since it gets maintained. So these are not uh, these are videos from my example from from the example application. It's just a random bird from Wikipedia. Um, it's uh, we will get to the real windows uh, to the desktop windows later, but I think uh, the the concepts can be presented very well with this example. Um, so now you drag the uh, the, uh, the bird in a weird direction and want to reset it, so you can press the trigger uh, because uh, the trigger has two sensors, one that, uh, one that is analog and one that is a di digital physical click. So if you drag it to the, to the end, then the orientation will reset. So the window will uh, go on top, uh, which is quite handy if you also change your position and want some windows facing to you. So the orientation reset is uh, quite handy. Uh, and if you want to move the window in space, so uh, we have the push-pull action where you can use uh, either the analog stick to, to drag the window while grabbing or the touchpad that is on, on other controllers. Um, and this conveniently moves um, the, the window in space uh, this, of course, requires a touchpad or an analog stick on the controller. For controllers that just have one button, um, this action would require a different kind of pointer. Um, so currently we have this ray pointer, which is just a straight ray, but uh, there are also parabolic pointers uh, where the, the, the pointer is a parabola, and when you turn the controller to, on the top, the window will come closer. But I have a video for that later. Mm. If you want to scale the window, you can use uh, the same thing as for pushing and pulling, but to the left and to the right, uh, as well as on the touchpad. Uh, scaling the window makes sense if you want to have um, more fine granular uh, movements, for example. If you want to draw something, it might make sense to have a big window. Um, so. So your hand movement uh, can do finer things. And if, if, if it's smaller, then there's a handshaking error that gets accumulated more if, if, if the window is smaller. We also have compensation for handshaking, uh, but this is just during the initial click. Since if you click something on the controller, your, your hand shakes a little bit, and we need to compensate that. Um, of course, all of our um, concepts you saw a multi hand so you can have two controllers and um, they they work independently so uh, you, you can scale one window and drag the other and uh, do everything with both hands uh, since I'm left-handed uh, I also paid attention that uh, all concepts are uh, independent of handedness <coughs> uh, so this is our menu um, uh, it's head tracked, so if, if, if you move the head, the menu will follow you. Uh, it won't uh, leave the field of view. So this is uh, not only practical for our uh, menu dialog uh, menu, but also for model dialogues. A model dialog in VR uh, needs to follow the head, since you could uh, 
go away and uh, it will stay at the same position. Uh, so, so the widgets need to be aware of, of the user's uh, position, of the user's head position, as well as the hand position. So the menu can also be opened on the hand. Um, it depends which uh, button or which controller you press the menu button on, uh, on which the, the, the menu appears. So you can open the menu on both. So handedness is not, uh, not a problem. Um, so we have a, a sphere alignment, which also respects uh, the, the position of the head. So the azimuth of the head will be the center of this spherical alignment. Uh, this is something that mimics uh, the expose mode from, two, uh, from 2D desktops or the activities overview in GNOME Shell. Uh, so the, the code is very basic for that. It's still pretty dumb, but uh, the idea is to have an expose that, that centers all windows around you. And of course, there could be different shapes for that. But since we are in 3D, we need to think of a 3D shape. And we have also a button that resets everything to its 2D desktop position. Uh, another interesting thing we have uh, on the pointer tip is the cursor hotspot. So we, we get the cursor from the window manager uh, uh, and uh, project, uh, put it on our pointer tip. And uh, the cursor has a so-called hotspot, so the texture of the cursor uh, is in a different position depending on what you're doing. For example, if, uh, if you want to drag this box, then the, the hotspot of the cursor is in the center. And uh, if you do the scale transformation, the hotspot is in a different place. So we have also support for that. Um, in VR runtimes, we have a concept of actions. Um, for example, in OpenVR, actions are defined in uh, JSON. So an action is, for example, uh, I want to grab the window. And uh, it's, uh, the action has a type, for example, this is Boolean. I'm grabbing the window, I'm not grabbing the window. Another action could be the position of, of the hand, uh, which is just the hand position. So in OpenVR, actions uh, have uh, analog, digital, and pose types. Um, but, uh, and also vectors uh, for, for, for analog actions. In uh, OpenXR, it's uh, quite similar. Um, so the actions are independent of the actual bindings. So in my application, I don't say, hey, uh, I want to put um, the grab on, on button A, but I say here's the grab action and it has to be bound to an analog button. Um, and uh, the, the, the mapping, the binding, can be actually also modified by the user. But we try to, uh, to implement um, sensible default bindings. So this is for, for the Knuckles controller. I separated the bindings into two parts. Uh, above is the 3D part, how you manipulate the windows in 3D. And below we have the 2D part, the, that's the part that gets synthesized or uh, emulated on the desktop. So we have, for the synthesis, we have left and right click on, on the A and B button and uh, scrolling left and, uh, or horizontal and vertical scrolling on the touchpad. So using the touchpad of the knuckles is quite intuitive since it's exactly as you would use your touchpad on the laptop. And here, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this may be too small to see. Uh, but, yeah, for example, opening the keyboard, we have a virtual keyboard that's implemented in the runtime, so it's not an XR desktop, but to open the virtual keyboard, you press uh, the analog stick. Um, and uh, also on the, on the Vive controller, that's like the older model, um, uh, as you can see, it lacks the analog stick and it lacks a, a few buttons. So we needed to get creative with that. Um, luckily, the touchpad can uh, recognize clicks. Uh, so we use the touchpad to, for example, do the left click. Um, but uh, these controllers are quite complex. It will get uh, more complicated to, to get this, this control scheme onto more 
primitive controllers. Uh, but usually a PC, PC controller, PC VR controller will look something like that. So this is like a modern state-of-the-art controller. And this is the last generation. So enough of uh, examples. Now I wanted to show you a full demo um, of how GNOME actually looks. And uh, let's see. So this is UI scaling. I guess it's not fitting the resolution. Um, so um, for example, this is Inkscape. And uh, as you can see, I'm using grabbing and resetting orientation a lot to, to, to move the window in space. And I actually can am able to do a path in Inkscape. And um, if, the, if the point array wouldn't occlude the, the tip, you would see that uh, all of the Inkscape uh, cursors are also displayed cor correctly in their context. Um, and uh, this is, uh, so in this demo I have the Inkscape window in a quite huge uh, mode, like I scaled it very large, so I can do more fine granular stuff uh, and uh, hit, hit the boxes. So now I did a very wonderful graphic. Um, and this is Klotzky. I really like that game because it's pretty. Um, and uh, playing like the like desktop games is is also quite doable. Um, at the end of Klotzky, you will see a model dialog. Uh, it opens on top of the other window, so we needed to be aware of that which model dialog belongs to which window to actually display it on top of it. Um, and Solitaire works as well. Actually, uh, playing solitaire in XR Desktop is a nice thing to do. So I, I would, if, if we had a list of supported applications, I would put solitaire on it because it has like large areas to, to click on. Uh, this is Krita uh, with a dark theme. And uh, what uh, I will do is just use uh, Krita um, as you would do with a mouse. But uh, we also have ideas to, to actually synthesize a Wacom tablet input. So you could have also pressure and stuff like that, uh, that you could map somehow on your VR controller. Because VR controller is full of sensors, it w would be really cool to map one of its analog sensors to, to the pressure. So, so you could actually use a painting, a 2D painting application. Uh, as precisely as you could with a with a tablet. Another thing that would be cool is to have like uh, windows, uh, uh, single windows on one controller. So you, ha I think that's it. Um, to have uh, like palette windows where you pick a color on on one controller and to to draw with the other one. So so. Uh, Mapping windows or uh, sticking windows to a controller is also a feature we would like to have sometime in the future. Um, so let's uh, let's get to a bit of technical stuff. Uh, how our libraries look. Um, so I hope that this is visible. For me, it is because I know it. <laughs> uh, on the bottom. We have our uh, Vulkan abstraction library. It's called Gulkan because it's a glib library, so I thought I started with G. Um, and uh, GXR is the library that interacts with, with the VR APIs. Uh, currently, we support OpenVR, but OpenXR is something I'm working like as we speak. So uh, when I'm back at home, I will continue working on that. Um, and these libraries are used by the XR Desktop library. And XR Desktop implements an overlay and a scene application. Uh, this means uh, a scene application it's, is its own renderer. So we have our internal scene graph and render everything out by ourselves. So we have more 
control over how things look and uh, we write our own shaders. And the overlay application uh, is something where we just send the window buffers as a rectangular shape to the VR runtime. And uh, this is how uh, the VR runtime is able to, to lay over uh, windows over a running application. So the full scene application cannot, uh, cannot run uh, simultaneously with other applications. Uh, so the overlays in OpenVR it's called overlays, in OpenXR it's called composition layers. Um, we also have a library to synthesize the input. Uh, it's called libinputsynth. Uh, so in this library we generate um, keyboard strokes that are emitted from, our, from the VR keyboard and uh, mouse input. Uh, in this, we could also like implement, like I said, a vacuum tablet input or wh whatever uh, concepts we can use in the 2D desktop. Uh, for lib input synth, we have several backends. I guess XDO is the one we use currently. It's um, it's an XARC uh, tool that has a library. Uh, it works fine, but on XARC, that's the problem that you have to see. The wind. So the window needs to be on the visible desktop to, to send a mouse event to it. On Wayland, the situation is a bit different. On Wayland, we have an experimental backend that uses uh, GNOME shells uh, clutter. So cl clutter is uh, able to, to, to send mo uh, mouse events in, in GNOME shell on Wayland. Um, and on Wayland, I guess it's very depending on the compositor how, how to synthesize the input. Um, and on top, we have like the window managers or the, win, uh, the desktop compositors. Uh, so in GNOME Shell, we have a patch set that implements that. So we have just uh, one class in GNOME Shell that uh, attaches a bunch of uh, uh, events to, to, to the um, to the matter uh, uh, objects, and uh, we we uh, share the texture to to the VR runtime uh, as soon as it's updated. On on Kwin, the situation is different. We don't patch Kwin, but Kwin has plugins. Um, so we uh, took a plugin, and we are able to to get also the buffers uh, that Windows are rendered into uh, in this plugin. Um, yeah, so this is just like a rough overview of our libraries. Um, right, I, I think I just said that. Um, so uh, synthesizing input uh, is different on X and Wayland, and uh, we would uh, prefer a solution where the window doesn't need to be visible to actually send clicks on that. Because uh, what we currently do is, if you if you want to uh, send input to a window, that's not that's for example on a different desktop, we need to switch the desktop to to that uh, the window is on to actually send a click on it Ooh, on on X11 at least. Uh, on Wayland, we probably don't, but uh, honestly, Wayland is not very well supported since we don't use it a lot. Uh, one reason for that is the lack of the direct mode on Wayland, which will hopefully uh, be implemented soon. Um, so uh, we share the window buffers uh, over an OpenGL Vulkan interop. So we uh, try to do zero copy sharing between the compositor and um, uh, the VR runtime. On the Vulkan, on the Vulkan side, you need the extension external memory, uh, which has a GL extension with it. It's called Memory Object. Uh, since the compositors currently are both implemented in OpenGL, so we need the Vulkan interop to e export DMA buff uh, from from the GL texture. Uh, the problem about that is uh, it's only available on AMD and NVIDIA currently. On NVIDIA, the situation is also a bit worse than on AMD. I currently have problems with uh, 
some buffers that have a weird format. For these buffers, I cannot use a zero copy, but I just need to re-upload the whole pixel buffer. But on AMD, the performance is quite good. Um, so that's the best experience to use GNOME Shell uh, in XR Desktop, is to use Mesa AMD driver, so the Radeon driver. Um, so that's also a thing I was talking about briefly. Um, we have uh, this overlay application that can show the desktop windows on top of a running VR application. Uh, and this is actually quite uh, useful since you can still interact with the desktop while you are in a VR game. So this is uh, how things look right now. Now I will give an uh, outlook of, of future things. Um, some future concepts uh, in UX we, we probably would like to have uh, is a parabolic pointer uh, which uh, works with more primitive controllers. It's not as exact uh, as using our current uh, concept, but uh, it may be more natural if, if, if you can just pull the window like with a lasso. Also, haptic and acoustic feedback is uh, a thing that's pretty useful in VR. So we currently, uh, in VR in general, the, the lack of haptic feedback uh, is a problem. So what we have is like vibration on the controllers, um, but we don't have like full haptic feedback where you can feel the objects. Um, one one uh, way to work around that is to have acoustic feedback um, when things happen. So good sound design is something very useful. Uh, also something that's called an interaction engine, which is basically uh, the combination of a physics engine and uh, input processing. Uh, so we want to have more physics elements. Uh, you saw of, uh, already physics elements in the head tracking, so we use acceleration, like primitive acceleration for that, um, combined with, with the position. And hand tracking, or at least finger tracking, is something uh, very natural to use in VR. And we need to think about concepts, how to implement that. So the Knuckles controller already has finger tracking. This is an example of a parabolic pointer. This is Steam VR Home, so you know what I was talking about all the time. Um, so as you can see, the pointer ray is not straight, but it's a parabola. And if you move it up, it uh, goes away. And if you move it down, it comes closer. Um, also, like 2D toolkit integration is something I currently have a series of experiments in. Uh, this is a GTK3 window rendered natively uh, in 3D. Uh, so in GTK3, I used off-screen window for that, which was now deprecated with GSK. And uh, in GSK, I already managed to upload uh, a GTK texture uh, from, from the pixel buffer, but it would really nice to have zero copy access to that. Another thing uh, I still need to figure out is how to generate input in, in GTK. Um, maybe I can talk to some GTK developers about that. So another big topic is native 3D UI. Uh, this is a demo from Leap Motion. Um, so uh, these are UIs built in 3D, and you, of course, want a 3D widget toolkit for that. Uh, what most of 3D UIs currently are is that they are built in a game engine, and there are not really toolkits or standards for that. Um, so this is a rather conservative 3D UI, since it's only a, basically a 2D UI bent and with some 3D optics on it, but 3D UI can also be using the whole space, like spherical layouts or uh, other 3D layouts, uh, topics in 3D UI, and uh, hand tracking and stuff like that, and physics. Uh, so this is something also I would like to look into in the future. Uh, what we now have is backwards compatibility with the classical 2D desktop, but this can be extended. Uh, also, font rendering improvements uh, would be a nice thing to have. Uh, currently, 
the we just use the resolution that the compositor renders in, but it would be really great to have uh, a dedicated proxy uh, for just VR in a higher resolution, which needs a level of detail because not all of the windows are at the same distance. So windows closer to you need to be in a more of a granular distance. Mozilla Pathfinder is an interesting project that uh, deals with XR rendering for fonts. Um, and also 3D UI in window manager protocols is a big topic. As I said, currently applications in the proprietary world mainly use game engines. Unity is a very popular one. We have Godot in open source. Um, but a real solution would be uh, for me that um, we have a protocol where the compositor knows what every application renders and can uh, composite it like we have in 2D. Uh, so you have to uh, imagine that an application is just an object and uh, you see many objects rendered at the same time, like objects in the real world. For example, you have an AR headset and your alarm clock is a virtual object and this would be, you would like to have uh, this to be one application and it, it's not necessary for the alarm clock to run Unreal Engine. and. Uh, uh, for others uh, to do the same. So it uh, would be cool to have a global scene ref. But that, these are topics we still need to discuss and there are also problems with that. I'm running out of time. So if you want to get involved, join us on XR Desktop on Freenode. Uh, talk to me or open an issue on Free Desktop. Uh, we are on GitLab on Free Desktop. And tomorrow I will do a hands-on demo. So if you want to try this, um, I will be next to the shirts. Uh, uh, demo will start about 11.30. Um, so if you want to try GNOME in VR, then you can do so tomorrow. And that's it for me. Thanks. Any questions, maybe? Yes, please. I wrote this PDE library called Geek. Uh, I have heard of it, but uh, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I would li really like to look into that. It's just fun. I mean, I haven't really. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's really. useful for your 3D stuff. So. Yeah, that might be interesting. Uh, are you planning to integrate Vulkan support as well? I have not. I, it's basically a port of, of, of 3AE as JS, and that's based on WebGL. So, yeah, that but I mean, all the all the shaders should <coughs> compile, and that's most of the work. And all the all the CPU side stuff are basically gonna be the same. So, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it should, I'm sure it would be not yeah. that hard to change it or to have a, a separate renderer that does Vulkan. Yeah, I, I guess that's at least interesting. I will look into that. I just heard of it yesterday, so. I, well, I mean, <laughs> I sort of wrote it or started with it a couple of years ago and then let it go. And then just this summer, I updated it to the latest and added a bunch more features. But it's it's still very much a toy, but it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, cool. I will try it. Okay, then. Oh, yeah. So... Um, for this project, I uh, didn't work on OpenHMD, but it will be able to run on OpenHMD since uh, like a layer above of the drivers. But me as a person, uh, I recently, so I, at FOSDEM, I still did two patch sets to OpenHMD. But we would like to extend Monado more, and I, I think in the future I will write more native drivers in Monado. Please, please use the mic. Rates, for example, because last time I checked, there was no positional tracking. Mm. It was only for Oculus. Yes. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> for your first problem is that the driver support is not there yet. So OpenHMD currently works on positional uh, Oculus support, and it will be there as soon as it uh, will be there. It will be picked up by Monado, and when we have a OpenXR backend, you will be able to put everything together. Just give us like three months. Okay, thank yeah, you very much. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm out of time. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, so uh, so the next part is about uh, the 